Thank you very much, Kushlani. Um, so this session is going to be on uh, introduction to integration platform. Um, so Sanjeeva's uh, keynote talk about connect the world. So the WSO2's vision is to connect the world. Basically, we have lots of applications, we have lots of people, and we have lots of devices. So the WSO2's vision is to connect all of them and provide a connected business uh, for our customers. So what we provide as WSO2 platform is the connected business platform, uh, starting with integration. That is going to be the uh, topic of this particular uh, track. Um, and we also have the mobile, big data, security, API, social, cloud, etc. But we'll start with the integration, right? So why do we need integration, all right? This is a typical picture you would see in any organization um, showing how the services or how the applications are connected to each other. Basically, it's very hard to modify, very hard to understand what's going on, and very hard to... Uh, you will not know if you modify one of the application, what are the other applications are going to get affected, right? So in order to simplify this particular architecture, uh, we use the integration platform. So WSO2 integration platform um, mainly consists of four products, and I will talk about some additional products as well, uh, which helps in uh, uh, helping on the integration side. Uh, so we'll start with the, the product which is in the middle, which is the enterprise service bus. So the functionality of enterprise service bus is to decouple the producer and the consumer, right? Uh, why do we have to do that? Uh, because you can independently modify the producer uh, without affecting the consumer, as well as you can independently uh, modify the consumer without affecting the producer. At the same time, you know exactly who is using whom and uh, have all the dependencies and impact analysis uh, available for you. So as part of the enterprise service bus, it can connect to any of the services available or any of the legacy systems available and then provide a uh, uh, API or provide a service uh, available for the upper layers. And also it can connect to various other cloud services. So we'll come back to the enterprise service bus in detail in the following uh, slides. So the second product is the business process server. Again, it provides the uh, orchestration and integration facilities for the services. I'll go back, uh, come back to that particular product and what differentiate the enterprise service bus and the business process server. Then we'll talk about the message broker, which, is, uh, which allows you to connect to any messaging frameworks or any messaging, uh, any application supporting the messaging. And then we have the data services server, which allows you to connect to any data and allows data to be integrated with other applications or with other data. So to start with the enterprise service bus, this is a simple schematic diagram of what's happening on the enterprise service bus. So at the upper layer, you have the message entry points. So whoever the client calls will be uh, will coming through the through one of these message entry points. So we have something called proxy services, which is a web service implementation, uh, which decouples the producer and provide uh, provide a interface for the consumer. Then we have an HTTP service, basically RESTful service uh, implementation. So the client can either talk in SOAP or by using uh, REST. Uh, the client can talk to the enterprise service bus. And then uh, we have a new concept called inbound transport. So basically, this is a new concept coming on the next version of the enterprise service bus. Inbound transport means uh, it's, a, it's again a specific ways of getting messages. For example, if you want to receive a message from JMS or if you want to receive a message from a file system, you configure an inbound transport to receive the messages, right? So it's a, it's a way of integrating various other systems in order to use uh, other services. So when the message is received by the uh, message entry point, then it will be 
processed by the processing layer. I will go uh, into more detail on the processing layer. But basically, it goes through a step of uh, processing. Can be anything. Can be, it can be a transformation. It can be um, uh, some validations. Or it can also talk to some external endpoints or talk to other services and then uh, get the response back. And once, the, uh, once all the processing is done, it will send back the response. So this is a very simple diagram of uh, what's happening inside the enterprise service bus. So we'll go into the more details of uh, how the processing happens. So we have, at the lowest level, we have something called mediators. So if you look at any language construct, you have some lowest level of language construct, right? So you can equate that particular language construct to a mediator. So mediator is the smallest unit which takes the data, which takes some configurations and process the data and then puts out another form of the data, right? So some of the examples of the mediators uh, are, can be like you get the message, you log the message, and then you let the message to go or some complex stuff like uh, XSLT. So you get the message, you apply an XSLT by using an XSLT mediator. Uh, you have an XSLT file written uh, on how to transform the message from input to the output. So XSLT will, uh, mediator will process the message and then put, uh, put out the output. Or it can be something like a switch mediator, which is like an if-else condition. So when a message comes, you look at the message, and see whether some condition is satisfied. If it is satisfied, you to take one path. If it is not satisfied, you take another path, right? So basically, in a sense, uh, the mediator is the smallest unit which process the message by using some configuration and then produce another set of messages. Then the sequence is the next level. Basically, it combines multiple mediators together to provide a functionality. So when a message comes, it will go through multiple set of sequences and then come out of the pipe. Basically, the response will be sent back to the caller. And then we have a new concept called uh, connectors. So basically, now we have uh, several online services available. Uh, there are lots of online services or uh, software as a services available. And those are like very, very much useful in order for you to provide automation. Um, it can, you can integrate them with your uh, internal organization or internal IT, and then provide various facilities. So um, again, uh, the connector is a different concept comparatively to the mediators because uh, there, are, there are several SaaS applications uh, produced every day, for example. There are new, uh, new uh, services available every day. Some of them are useful, some of them are not useful, and you will not know when they will, be, they will become useful. So the architecture allows you to write a connector and then drop it into the enterprise service bus and available it as a language construct so that you can use it the similar way you are using the embedded uh, mediators when you define your integration scenarios, right? So WSOT ESB supports all the enterprise integration pattern. Uh, the enterprise integration patterns by um, uh, Gregor Hopp. Uh, so basically, this particular book uh, defines multiple enterprise integration patterns. Um, so these enterprise integration patterns are commonly used in almost all the organizations when they define um, what kind of inter integration has to happen, right? So this is a non-pattern. So it's very easy to take a non-pattern for a non-problem and then map WSOT products or map WSOT ESB into how to solve this particular pattern. So WSOT ESB uh, has support for almost uh, all the enterprise integration patterns, and we have documented all the catalogs of uh, how to implement these enterprise integration patterns. So from feature-wise, uh, it supports multiple transports. So it's not only the HTTP, but you can receive messages from various other different protocols, uh, different transports. And also, you have support for various protocols like JSONs, 
XML, HL7, binary protocols, and so on. Uh, and then we talk about the connectors. But basically, what I really want to say is basically these are like low level language constructs available for you to define your integration pattern. And there are several patterns, like routing, for example, when a message comes, you look at some of the message, some of the items in the message, and then send it to one or the other places. Or when a message comes, you look at the message and either uh, drop it or you send it to some other endpoint, uh, which is called filtering. Or you get a message, you convert the message into something else, and then call an endpoint or call a service. Or you get a message in one protocol, you switch the message into some other protocol, and so on and so on. So basically, the language constructs, or the low-level uh, language constructs available, allows you to define your integration in whatever the way you want. And these are available as a language construct. So it's up to your visualization, up to your imaginations to define a, a flow by using any of these language constructs. Uh, so the last part, the service chaining is a special case. Uh, so ESB supports you to orchestrate or compose multiple services into a single service. So there are, might be cases where a message comes. Um, you have to talk to one of the service. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a um, uh, tax service, basically and get the response, and then talk to some other service. Maybe it can be a discount service, and take a response. And talk to third service, uh, maybe a, a commitment calculation service, and get the response. And then combine all these three responses together. All these three um, um, uh, responses came th from three different places together. Combine a message, and you send back the response back to the uh, caller. Right? So this particular scenario is called service chaining. Typically, the pattern is called service chaining, and ESB supports service chaining inherently. Why I am specifically going into that particular detail is I will talk about that again when, I, when we talk about the uh, business process server. And uh, we have the tooling support by using the WSO2 uh, developer studio. Uh, you can visually define your integration scenarios by using the WSO2 developer studios. And as far as possible, we have used the icons similar to the enterprise integration pattern so that you can easily understand what's going on by the look of the, uh, uh, the visualization and understand what this particular integration does. Right? So the next talk is going to be on uh, WSO2 Enterprise Service Bus specifically, and we will go into, uh, Kasun will go into more details about uh, how we can use this particular product. OK, so I talk about the service chaining scenario in uh, relation to the WSO2 ESB, but there are some integrations or some orchestration you have to do which will last for a long time. For example, you get a request for a loan, and the manager has to approve the loan. So there is a human intervention happening, right? And the manager might be on leave today, so, and he might come after like one month or uh, two months. So the particular process has to wait for a long time before you can finish the process. So if your process has any human interventions, or if your process has to live for a long time, that means that particular process has to store all the states until that particular process finishes. Right? So this particular orchestration, the uh, composition of the services or the orchestration of the services have to be long-lived and has to have states. Then enterprise service bus is not the correct product to do that. Right? So the enterprise service bus is considered as very short-lived processes or very short-lived service uh, uh, composition. And the service composition you are doing is for some technical reasons, then it's a good candidate for enterprise service bus. If, if your service composition has statefulness or if it is long-lived or if there are human interventions, then the correct product you have to use is the WSO2 business process server. So WSO2 Business Process Server, again, uh, supports all the human tasks uh, 
um, specifications. So uh, it supports three specifications mainly. Uh, WS BPL, where you define the business process using the BPL language, and the human task, uh, which allows you to define uh, any human interventions or any human interaction with the process. And a human task has two particular versions, uh, so we support all of that. And in the next version of the business process server, we will have support for BPM and support as well. Uh, so we are working on that, and we will provide. Uh, the support. So if your process is long running and if it has stateful natures, because it is long running, then uh, WSO2 business process server will be used in order to do the integrations. And uh, as part of the process execution, it also captures all the statistics um, of the processing and collects in the business activity monitor. We will talk about the analytics a bit later. But basically, these kind of statistics are collected and then uh, can be used to uh, further optimize your process so that you, your process will be uh, much more efficient than what you had previously. So it's kind of a loop back, uh, uh, feedback loop, uh, which helps you to optimize and uh, fine tune your processes. Again, uh, the tooling support is coming from the WSO2 uh, Developer Studio, uh, which it has a BPL uh, development environment. Uh, you can define the BPL processes here. And as part of the BPL, uh, one of the main f functionality of the BPL is on the compensation side. Um, so if there are any error happens, basically uh, you have to go and compensate. So you do some actions, there is an error, Either you can roll back in the case of atomic transaction, etc., or you can go and compensate for the actions you have already done. And those kind of supports can be done by using the BPL, and uh, then you can run the BPL process in the WSO2 business process server. The next product is the WSO2 data services server. So, uh, let's say you have multiple data sources available. Can be RDBMS, can be uh, Excel sheets, can be uh, some NoSQL database like Cassandra or MongoDB, etc. And then you want to integrate them together in your integration logic, right? Uh, so first, uh, first, uh, what you have to do is expose those data services in an integratable service uh, interface. So. WSO2 data services server allows you to define a set of queries and uh, expose your data sources into uh, composable services. It can be SOAP or it can be REST, uh, but it allows you to uh, use them in uh, integrations. So basically when a request comes, the data services server will receive it, and then it finds what operations or what path or resource of the service call uh, happening, and then identifies the query, uh, SQL query, uh, and then execute the SQL query against the uh, data source. So it can be RDBMS, so if it is Cassandra, then there's a SQL-like query, or if it's an Excel, uh, then you have, uh, a, uh, again, query specific to S S Excel, etc. And once the uh, processing happened, uh, the response will be sent back to the requester. So again, it has uh, several features, allows you to integrate uh, multiple data sources, starting with uh, uh, nested query. Basically, when you call one, qu one query, um, one particular data source, you get a set of responses for that particular query. And for some of the subparts of the response, we can call and get some additional records about uh, uh, that particular part. For example, let's say you have a customer table. You call customer table, and it contains the customer name, customer uh, department, and address one, address two, and so on. Now, by using the address one, you can call another data source and collect all the address about the customer, and then combine those two records, those two uh, responses, and then send back to the requester. So that is called the nested queries. 
So next feature is the notification. Um, so when the request comes or when we produce a response, we can run some conditions against the request or the response and then create notification if some conditions met. For example, uh, let's say you are calling an order service, and if the database has lesser number of uh, items available, then we can generate, uh, order, generate a notification um, saying this particular item is, uh, this particular column in the table is running lesser than 10 items, which can trigger a purchasing or procurement process from there. So it's, it's kind of integrating multiple services together, but the triggering point is uh, conditions available as part of the response. Similarly, there can be a conditions as part of the request. So somebody tries to update your salary, and your salary is more than allowed uh, amount, then it can trigger a notification saying it's a fraud activity or somebody had to approve or something. So that's a notification triggered from a request. Then batch processing is also supported in the data services server. Uh, so it can be like client-side batching or server-side batching. Um, so let's say if you want to write uh, uh, 100 records at a single request, single service request, um, you don't need to define a separate query for that. You define a single insert query and say enable batch processing. Basically, it will generate a batch processing operation uh, in order to support that. So basic, uh, these are like kind of optimal uh, way of uh, producing some request. And then distributed transactions are also supported. So again, uh, one of the talk in this particular track is going to be on the business process server and the uh, data services server. Anjana will do a talk on that. Uh, uh, in afternoon. So the next product we use is the message broker. Uh, basically, it's a message distributed message broker, which allows you to connect multiple brokers together and provide a distributed queue. Uh, again, the message broker provides the point-to-point -point as well as publish subscribe uh, uh, messaging models. Uh, publish subscribe can be durable as well as we support hierarchical topics, wildcard subscription, etc. And from protocol side, we support JMS, MQP, MQTT um, uh, uh, as part of the message broker. Again, there is going to be another talk on the message broker to go into more details on the message broker. So when we talk about the integration platform, uh, again, one of the common problem is on the identity. Um, so identity server is used as the identity federation and single sign-on. Identity integration is a common problem. Um, basically, if, let's say if you want to talk to 10 different services, you want to uh, authenticate only once and then call all 10 different services can be, uh, they can be like secured using different protocols. Uh, so identity server provides all that uh, single sign-on and the identity federation facilities. So that's one of the other product heavily used in the integration space. Provision is the other problem. So let's say if there is an employee comes to your organization, um, so you want to provision that particular user in multiple applications. Um, so identity provision uh, can be used in order to achieve that. Identity server has several protocols, uh, something called SCIM uh, or SPML, and it can uh, allow you to provision users in various systems by using uh, these uh, methodologies. The governance registry is also used heavily in the case of integration platform. Uh, basically, it's a metadata repository. So uh, it allows you to identify what are the services available, what are the impact uh, when you modify some services, what are the consumers of the services, etc. So basically, it's a common place where you have all your artifacts and the metadata um, so that you can identify what's going on in your organization. API management is the uh, other product used uh, when you have the integration. So basically, integrations allow you to create some new capabilities. 
and the API manager allows you to expose those new capabilities for your partners so that they can come and consume, right? So why you are doing uh, integration is to provide some capabilities so that other people can reuse the capabilities available. Analytics platform uh, is, again, heavily used. Uh, I talk about the business processor as well as uh, uh, even in the case of ESB or any other integration platform, the common uh, use case is like you collect all the data together, analyze it, and then optimize the integration, etc. Right? So um, analytics platform will become very useful in the case of integration. Uh, it has its own usefulness in uh, analytics itself, but uh, when it used together with the integration, uh, uh, we, we uh, get uh, several values out of this platform. And this is a product, or this is uh, part of our public cloud uh, initiative. Uh, we are working on the integration cloud. Uh, basically, this allows, uh, this allows you to define commonly used services, uh, software as a services, and integration between them, and allow them to, allow them, uh, allow you to define them as something called recipes. So basically, for example, you want to search some tweets and then send an email. That's a common pattern. Or you want to get some information from Jira uh, about customer tickets and then write it on an Excel sheet. Again, that's kind of a common uh, problem people are having. So you define those kind of problems as recipes and then create some instances of the recipe in order to uh, execute these on a periodic manner. So in, uh, integration cloud allows you to define cloud-to-cloud um, uh, -cloud integrations, etc., and uh, this is powered by WSO2 ESB. So those are our products in the integration platform. We will go uh, into more details, uh, deep dive into that in coming talks. Uh, Kason, uh, Ramit, and Anjana will take you through uh, more details into each of these products. Um, so. That's the end of my talk.